Hello everyone. Welcome to NPTEL Groundwater Hydrology and Management course. This is week four, lecture one. In the past week lectures, we were looking at the introduction to groundwater and uh, some components that are very important for groundwater. In this week, we'll do a recap of week one to three and see how the past three weeks are linking with this current week. In the first week, we looked at the introduction to groundwater, wherein we understood what is groundwater, how much fresh water is available on the planet, and out of the fresh water, how much is groundwater. In week two, we looked at the importance of groundwater at both international and national stages. In the international stage, we quantified groundwater in different major aquifers and plains. And we found that one third of the groundwater basins are tremendously stressed. They are under uh, depletion, unsustainable abstraction, and so there is one third of them under tremendous stress. Then we came to the Indian context in week two, uh, and we stressed on the fact that India is the leading groundwater extractor in the world with approximately 260 to 265 kilometer cube extraction per year. <coughs> we also looked at what are the major drivers for groundwater depletion. And we found that it is mostly linked with agricultural and industrial use. In agriculture, we also looked at some crops like wheat, rice, uh, and uh, sugarcane that were consuming more groundwater. In week, we looked at the groundwater hydrology concept and we looked at the major components for groundwater hydrology. The same way, we will also look at some groundwater hydrology concepts for this week because there is a lot of components and uh, since this is an undergraduate level course we will look into detail some of the components not all but some of the components which would help you to understand groundwater hydrology and also to run models moving on the first and very, very important uh, component would be porosity. The porosity is defined as the fraction of volume of pore and void space in soil. It gives you a fraction of the total volume of the solid of voids and voids is the space in between the solid material. We looked at it uh, in the previous week's lecture and uh, the divided by the total volume of the solid. So this porosity gives you a good fraction, uh, a ratio of uh, the amount of uh, space, pore space present inside a solid material to the total volume of the material. So think about it. Uh, if, you, if the volume uh, is too big compared to the pore space, then the phi or the porosity value is very, very less. And such a less porosity medium or a solid or a sediment cannot store more water. Uh, it, it is important to understand this value as it stores for the water for further allocation, for the percolation, which is movement of water uh, under the ground, and also for groundwater movement. Quickly, let's look at A, B, C, D, E, and F, the images on the screen. You can see that the blank space <coughs> that is uh, present inside the uh, solid material is the volume of void. Okay, and uh, the total volume of all this would be VT. And if you just sum all these volumes together, it will be total will be VV. So the ratio gives you porosity. The pore space can be filled with air or water, that is okay. But now we are very interested only in the space. Uh, it can be filled with water, it can be filled with a mixture of 
uh, air and water uh, it can be any uh, thing that can be occupied however it should not be the solid material it should not be sand so that for example is given in b you have a material but in between you have some smaller materials so uh, we need to subtract all of those while we estimate the volume there are different ways to estimate the porosity uh, and first let's look at why it is very important Solids, rocks and sediments in the surface and subsurface consist of a matrix of solid mineral grains and or spaces. When you say matrix, it's an arrangement of the solid material. You have the rocks and, and smaller rocks present in the material which forms the matrix uh, and they are not gelled together, they are stuck together but there is some space and that space is called total medium is called porous or a soil media and this is the space where groundwater can go in groundwater is not going to take out a sediment and then get itself stored that could happen in a flood and other situation a normal groundwater recharge infiltration <coughs> needs a space for example if you have solid rock which is not weathered uh, and rainwater falls on it water will not move in because there is no pore space it will just wet the rock and the water will flow down. However, here we are looking at a case where the water needs to move in and that movement is through the soil material or solid matrix, uh, wherein it goes through the pore spaces and joins the pore space and comes down. Sometimes if it cannot move down due to gravity and still water is coming, it moves laterally horizontally and we will see uh, what that constitutes. Uh, so let's uh, take an example from the um, hydrogeology book, uh, Principles and Practice. Um, you could see very clearly there are multiple types of porosity uh, with relation to the rock and solid type. Okay, uh, The first one A is a well sorted sedimentary deposit. An introduction in geology for sediment means it is transported by a medium. The medium could be air or water. So wind can blow sediments, but mostly we are talking about water like rivers, streams, glacial melt. So water will bring the sediments and gets deposited. While it gets deposited as sedimentary rocks, they have high porosity because you expose it to air, there's, there's some space and then another layer comes with water, another layer comes with water. So there is good amount of space in between the pore space, which is A, and then it is well sorted, which means the size is almost more or less the same. And that is called a well sorted medium. Then we have the poorly sorted sedimentary deposit B, which has a low porosity compared to A. Well, why does this have a very low porosity? Or what do you mean by low sorted, poorly sorted sediment? You could see that the size is not the same of the solid materials and there are smaller materials present inside the pore space, which actually prevents water from entering. It occupies a volume which is not good for groundwater. So that those kind of material are called poorly sorted and poor porosity materials. Then we come to C. C is similar to A, which you can see that what is the commonality? A and C is well sorted, almost a size is same. So that gives you extra pore space in between the rocks. Uh, <coughs> but the important factor in C is C surface of the rock or the material also has pore spaces and those have extra space for water to be stored right so the it adds up the volume it might be a drop but all the drops add up for groundwater similar like a flood uh, surface water flood you have rain coming only by drops but then it adds up and then you have floods same way here all these small tiny tiny water particles would add up to constitute the groundwater aquifer so now if you ask me would a have more water or c have more water if both are same sorted same uh, material etc 
C would have more because on the surface you still have some water. Okay, it's not only between the rock materials, but also on the rock materials you have water particles, uh, which are available for other uses: evaporation, transpiration, uh, plant extraction, <coughs> and groundwater flow. So, well sorted sedimentary deposit consisting of pebbles that are themselves porous. So, the whole deposit has a very high porosity. So, the whole deposit or the, the sedimentary layer, that layer has more porosity than A. Okay. Then we go to D. Well sorted, look at the size. It is well sorted sedimentary deposit whose porosity has been reduced by the deposition of mineral matter, which means in between the uh, material, it is well sorted, the sizes are almost same, but in between there is a cementation, a fluid material that uh, of the mineral material uh, that actually gels them together. So in fact, there has been a porosity, but the porosity is occupied already by the mineral matter itself. So the porosity is reduced. So from A, it is reduced because the black material is filled, which is a, a formation process of the uh, rock and mineral. So that mineral content would actually deplete your porosity. Moving on to E, it is a soluble rock made porous by solution. So initially it was a rock. Okay, So this is a, a material which is initially a rock, <coughs> but slowly water or other chemical uh, substances started to dissolve the rock and flow through. Okay, Think of like chalk, uh, the simple experiment you can do at home. Uh, if you have a chalk and then you pour water, it can actually put a hole through the chalk and then you come out. Uh, same way here, this material uh, in the real life scenario could be limestone uh, in, the, in the caves and mountains you see this. So limestone is a big rock, uh, but when water goes in uh, through the rock and, and uh, uh, formation, it will cut through it and cut through it and that causes porosity. Yes, the water was occupied, but while it cuts, it also goes out of the system. So after that, there is space for the water to get stored and so thereby increasing the porosity. There are many, many caves like that in India, but mostly outside the world, uh, it is called, called karst geology, <coughs> wherein a mountain uh, or a, a small hill uh, stations and etc. under that would be cut through water. Uh, Batu Caves in Malaysia is very famous too and known for it. Uh, the water would just carve the inside of the mountain and the hills and then it comes out. So you have a big hole. It's like tunneling, <coughs> it's like tunneling, but not through mechanical means, by natural means. Then we have F type, which is a crystalline rock made porous by fracturing. So the rock is there, okay? Uh, the same like E, a rock is there, but the rock did not uh, crack because of water alone. But here there is weathering also. Fracturing is a process in weathering where the rock breaks. The rock would break by elements, the weather elements like heat, sunlight's heat and uh, movement of rocks. Uh, and also water that, that can enter through the rock can crack it. Okay, So in the cold time, uh, the water expands and cracks the rock. So those fractures uh, are um, porous space. You Once you fracture it, there is space. So think like this is your rock and there's no space in between, but then you fracture it. So now the water can be stored in between. So what is the difference between this F porosity and E porosity? F porosity, once the fracture is made, the most it can do is maybe, uh, you know, uh, the size of the fractures can be a little bit more increased because water goes in and stuff, but it's not soluble. Whereas E is, it's, it is soluble, it just dis dissolves the rock. So it's, if you had five uh, fractures, uh, as water and other uh, elements move, it can dissolve the fractures into a massive one fracture. So all these tunnels and you uh, underground rivers that you see are made by this movement of water. <laughs> And those are big porous space. So that is a porosity. 
but very, very big. <coughs> the rivers that you see under the ground. Uh, but F is uh, mostly the cracks, and that is why you see, even though it is uh, similar to E, uh, it is in a connected, more connected, and uh, a fractured kind of a pattern. This is a starting point for characterizing uh, the fluid flow through porous media according to Darcy's law. We will get into Darcy's law and experiments, and slowly we will look at the equations for unconfined. Uh, and confined aquifers. Uh, we, we've looked at the uh, unit uh, of analysis as an aquifer in the previous lectures. Um, uh, here we will get into the subcomponents in the aquifers. And the first property that we saw of the aquifer is the porosity. How much pore space is there in my aquifer uh, is very important to understand so that I can store the water. Let's look at some more uh, graphical representations. So the first uh, material you see is the actual uh, soil or a rock matrix, the arrangement of rock and soil materials. What you see, it is a kind of a well sorted. Uh, you see minute particles in between. There is good uh, solid particles, and also there is inter space between the particles. So these uh, solids are represented as the uh, dotted and uh, dark uh, lined circles, whereas the voids are in gray color. So now if we shift it as just partitioning it, it into three components, uh, you can look at as the material as a partially saturated soil, wherein there is solids, the blue things are the solids, and there is a mixture of water and air which means the pore space, this space can be occupied by water and some of the space can be occupied by air. In a normal scenario, uh, it might be uh, like uh, this. So you will have water uh, entering in up to a location till here, right? And that um, location would actually mean that is the water table as we saw in the previous uh, lectures. Basically, you would have uh, water until here, so which means all this pore space would be full of water. There's some spaces might be closed, but most of it is water. And this is your air. So all the void uh, particles here are filled with air along with the solid. So the solid is there, air is there on the top. In the bottom, it is solid and water. If you take the volumes, it would look like this. Your um, solids and other things. Okay. So uh, you have a mixture of air, water and solids, uh, but in a fully watered system. Okay, So I, I apply full water into the soil, which uh, you do during your irrigation uh, practice. You apply full water cycle and when you apply so much water, what happens is the air goes to almost zero level. Negligible air is present. Uh, so how, how, how would this look like? It will be looking like a, uh, a solid like this. It's full of water. Okay, All this uh, area is covered with water and uh, that would be uh, driving out all the air out. So now you have a system where all of this is water and um, that is a fully saturated soil. <coughs> so the partially <coughs> some uh, area was not saturated with water on the top, but in a fully saturated, all the air spaces are driven out. So now your farmer is happy. You start with a system where there is air and water, there are plants, and then you put water more so that the plants can take water. Okay, That's how water moves, right? Water will go down and push the air out um, in the groundwater. Now it is fully saturated soil. Slowly the plants are taking it out and the sun is evaporating the water on the surface of the soil and soon all the water is lost and at that time there is zero water in your um, solid material and thereby you only have air and solids air in the void space the black uh, gray space 
and then you have um, uh, solid materials as rock materials. So, so what happens is the volume of void is the same, but the composition of water and air will change. The solid is the same. Look at it. The solid volume is almost the same. It doesn't change. So don't uh, assume uh, or think that the solid material would change. It is the same volume. See, it is the same volume across the different um, types. Uh, dry soil, fully saturated soil, and a partially saturated soil. What actually happens is because of the application of water or extraction of water, the void space, the space where air and water can changes. Okay, uh, the space changes as in it. Can which is fully saturated or with air and water, a mixture of air and water, which is partially saturated or only air, which is a dry soil. And this is a danger for your farmer because he or she has to start irrigating. Okay, so this air uh, uh, is not conducive for farming. We will look at the uh, porosity and how it is uh, estimated in the field. Okay. How do you determine porosity uh, for every site? Is it possible, like every farmer, can they actually uh, do a test? A test is done by taking the sample to the um, lab. Uh, and when the sample is taken, uh, a mass is taken, or it is a, a volume is taken in a measured container. And then you take it to the lab and crush it. So when you crush it and powder it, all the voids would become less. Why? because you are you are changing the structure the matrix of the solid uh, and actually you are converting it into a fine fine solid when you do a fine solid all the pore spaces come down so you crush it and then you push it in so the volume is uh, reduced okay now if you know the volume before and after crushing you can estimate the porosity how do you drive the water out you actually throw these solid into a oven uh, and heat it for at least two to three days, 100 degrees centigrade, uh, thereby driving the water out. So the oven would be on for two or three days uh, because it's very hard to get all the water out. It will be stuck inside the solid and they will uh, do it uh, slowly. It is a very slow process. So once you take it out, the water is removed, then you crush the solid to remove the air inside uh, and then you estimate the volume. So you have a volume before and a volume after. Now, the question is, can you do that for every field, every village in India? It is very, very costly and time consuming. Therefore, if you know the type of the solid material and the geological map, you can estimate how much uh, would be the porosity. And for that, there is a lot of uh, books and materials. The hydrogeology principles and practice uh, version 2021 uh, year and you can see the type of geological material uh, sediments uh, sandstone shales scars limestone etc uh, and you could see how the hydraulic conductivity and porosity changes we'll come to hydraulic conductivity later, but the porosity varies as um, you could see here uh, 0.05 to 0.35. Sometimes it is represented as a percentage. So 5% to 35% is uh, volume of uh, uh, airspace as per, as per this number. Okay, so just visually thinking, which ones would have the biggest value? So the biggest values would be in the fracture, right? The fractures uh, have a good um, amount of uh, porous space because it is cracked and the cracks could be joined. So that is 50% approximately, uh, but also your uh, lacustrine, which is your along the rivers and oceans, silt and clay deposits. The deposits, as I said in the early slide, will have the uh, high uh, values for porosity and in fact that is the biggest porosity on the list <coughs> okay the <coughs> limestones and karst as i said uh, it is uh, a big uh, porous space but sooner or later all the pore space would be gone uh, which means the solid material would be dissolved all of it and so the the solid material will crush down 
So uh, you could estimate it up to a particular level, which is 0.5, but after 0.5, the water will just eat through the system. So in uh, uh, your agriculture related work, it will be fluvial deposits, glacial deposits, uh, sandstone and mudstone, especially in India, it will be your sandstones, uh, silt and clay, uh, fluvial deposits, and um, some, uh, some more or less shale and fractured. So more or, most of them are in the fractured uh, network. So if you know the solid, if you know the type of geology in a particular location, you can estimate porosity. How do you get at the geology? <coughs> You can use the geological map of India by Survey of India um, and Geological Survey of India. So these maps are very handy, which give you the geological setting in a uh, in India. And this is a stationary setting. You cannot change the geology overnight. <coughs> it has been a big long process, um, and so uh, these maps, uh, even though they are old, are very informative in giving what type of rock is present under the ground and based on the rock the porosity can be estimated uh, for example the ganges plain you have all these uh, deposits from lactrine and silt and clay um, and fluvial deposits so fluvial deposits are more alluvium and so the range you can say is 0.05 to 0.35 or 3 or 5 to 35 percentage so someone can ask me sir why do you have uh, such a range the range could be uh, due to the use of the soil and the maintenance of the soil, tilling and other things and what plants are growing in. So always there is a range. There is no one value associated with porosity. Moving on, uh, the porosity uh, space uh, and the amount of water that enters into the soil is not stationary. Okay, As I explained in the previous differentiation between partially filled, fully uh, saturated soil, uh, the uh, amount of water inside the soil would change. Let's take a calendar year, Jan to December, uh, in a system where you have good monsoon uh, in um, uh, Feb, March, April, uh, and then uh, summer uh, would kick in in June, peak summer and June, July. So what happens is you have uh, initially uh, you start in Jan where you come from winter you have some uh, you know uh, water coming into the system so the so soil moisture is okay point um, uh, about point one and wilting point is the line and below which if soil moisture comes down you have to irrigate the field at once okay it is very very important to irrigate the field after wilting point. Uh, so this is on the x-axis. Uh, it is the amount of water content in the soil, okay? how much water is present. Um, and uh, your porosity is the maximum. So this is the maximum uh, pore space uh, above which water cannot exist. right? So this pore space is so much, and you can fill it until the uh, porosity is reached, which is fully saturated soil. OK. So now you start the system, uh, there is some water in the pore space and then the water increases. The water increases um, uh, above the field capacity. The field capacity is the best amount of water which is needed by the plant to survive. If you go above and too much above, then plants can suffocate. So you have to be careful in watering after this. Okay, uh, there is groundwater recharge from melting snow and springs. As I said, Jan, Feb would be the time when spring comes. So all the water would melt and the melted water can go into the groundwater. So you have an increase um, and then there is some rain and etc. Then your summer starts. So soil moisture is depleted as evaporation. Uh, the summer pulls the water out through evaporation and plants, plants are taking the water and transpiring. So there is transpiration. Then you come down, the soil moisture comes down in the pore space and it comes be below the field capacity. So at this point, it is very, very uh, important for the plants to get water to survive. So what do you do? You actually um, uh, start irrigating the field by other resources. Uh, otherwise, what would happen is, uh, there is a small rain. So here you can see summer rain is there. <coughs> a small heavy rain happens. 
but most of the soil moisture is depleted uh, because of the summer and plant activity and then it goes below field capacity and wilting point when it goes below wilting point it has to be recharged either by rainfall or by uh, other means so otherwise you should stop planting the crops uh, so once you plant the stop planting the crops the soil moisture starts to rise again because your transpiration is coming down uh, and also your snow and other rain are coming up so this is a uh, system in the uh, cold weather uh, snow climate uh, season uh, site and that site clearly shows that it is going up and down in the next uh, lecture we would also see how this can be compared to a system in india in the uh, tropical or, or uh, even the central parts of india where you have mostly uh, summer and winter winter no snow but uh, a very low amount of rainfall and also uh, a long summer followed by a monsoon so with this i would like to conclude the first uh, week uh, lecture uh, day one uh, on your groundwater uh, porosity and other aspects.